Let's think about what the interpersonal outcomes of internalized depression are. One outcome is what's known as the dramatization of feelings. This happens when feelings intensify because of powerlessness in the face of dominant class definition and control over the social order. It also results in hypervigilance. When situations occur that are similar to past traumatic events when the person experienced racism. Children often have their self-confidence destroyed when parents have concerns about the child fitting in. And teamwork could be affected if non-whites become hypercritical of their non-white counterparts. Leaders can be criticized by their non-white counterparts for not doing enough to change the status quo. And individuals can become defensive and withdraw and may feel shame for being part of their racial group. And as we've already discussed, stereotypes about the person's group may become internalized. On the other side of the spectrum from internalized depression is internalized white supremacy. This happens when whites become convinced of their own superiority over other races. Considering that society is set up with white culture as the standard, it would be difficult to avoid this occurrence. This feeling of supremacy is taught to whites through the actions of other whites and through the very culture of society. The idea of whiteness started to emerge when Europeans colonized the New World. It makes sense as the European lighter skin tone stood in contrast to the indigenous peoples of the New World. Whites began to believe that their skin tone made them stand apart and that their light skin was evidence of their superiority. Internalized white supremacy has some negative outcomes. Whites will often support policies that they think will prevent non-whites from getting economic or educational advantages, even if it would assist the whites as well. Whites also become socialized to think that they're entitled to social outcomes, such as success and happiness. And if they don't obtain these entitlements, then they lash out at other groups, thinking that the non-white group has caused the loss of entitlement. White supremacy becomes internalized because it's not examined and not questioned. We know that this internalization leads to what's known as implicit bias. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or the stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions, and our decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. Residing deep in the subconscious, these biases are different from known biases that individuals may choose to conceal for the purpose of social and or political correctness. Rather, implicit biases are not accessible through personal introspection. The implicit associations we harbor in our subconscious cause us to have feelings and attitudes about other people based on characteristics such as race, ethnicity, age, and appearance. These associations develop over the course of a lifetime, beginning at a very early age through exposure to direct and indirect messages. In addition to early life experiences, the media and news programming are oft-cited origins of implicit associations. The physiological wage of whiteness is referring to whites being invested into their beliefs of white supremacy and that they choose status and privilege gained from whiteness as the norm over material or economic gains. The white racial frame is how whiteness as the norm is created. The white racial frame is made up of stereotypes, metaphors, images, emotions, and the discriminatory practices that hold whites up as superior to non-whites. At the same time, two emotions may be playing out within a white person's experience. There can be fear associated with examining their privilege as a white person, fear of admitting things they did not earn, fear of losing things they feel they have already earned, fear of losing power to an emerging new majority of non-whites, 
and fear of being seen as racist. There are different strategies and programs to reduce and resist internalized racism. Depending on whether you're part of the dominant group or the subordinate group, you might engage in different strategies. Both groups use education as a strategy to get past internalized racism to help them understand how social change can take place. Learning about how racism started in this country, in other words, the history of both whites and non-whites, can help people understand the historical roots. Also, examining policies and seeing how certain laws and policies have created advantages for some groups help people identify racism and understand that it's real. Anger is a predictable outcome when awareness is increased and when the status quo is challenged. So creating sanctuaries for non-whites, in other words, places that they can go to discuss the issues with others, is an important aspect of creating safe places, both emotionally and physically. Being able to discuss feelings, including anger and disappointment, is seen as a beneficial strategy to reducing internalized racism. Whites, on the other hand, may feel anger because they realize there are inequities in the system. Whites are often taught that they should be polite and silent about racial issues. Those that are concerned should feel anger that others are not examining the issues and discussing the unfairness of those issues. It can be uncomfortable to talk about race, so some people avoid it, not wanting to be uncomfortable or not wanting to make others uncomfortable. Healing is another important aspect of social change. After discussions are initiated and then emotions are sparked, then healing should take place. These are all predictable stages of awareness that most people generally feel. That's not to say that all people go through all stages, but a general framework of what most people will experience as they go through these general phases. Your text discusses all of these phases more in depth. There are also other models, such as the journey of race and culture, that I often use as an exercise in some of my race and diversity courses. This model emphasizes the path that whites versus blacks often experience, and that each group may have very different emotions and experiences as they go through their journey to valuing diversity. It's a different model, and you may see some similarities but also some differences between these two models if you compare the journey of dominant class by Huntley and the stages of white awareness listed by Scott. 